So welcome everyone. We have with us Anjali, who's going to be giving us a talk on careers in the age of acceleration. Um, Anjali, uh, over to you. Go ahead. If you could go ahead and share your screen. Awesome. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. And for those of you who are joining us from other parts of the world, uh, or like where I'm at, good morning and good afternoon. I want to start the session with a question. Uh, look at the slide and think about which emotion best describes how you feel when you ask this proverbial interview question, where do you see yourself five years from now? You know, 10 years ago, I felt my work world was changing at a pace faster than I could keep up with. My emotions resembled mostly what's on the right-hand side of the slide. I was anxious, I was confused, I was uncertain. After years of feeling confident, I wasn't feeling so sure about my work. You know, studies indicate that by the year 2030, half of the jobs of today will likely be automated. And half of the jobs that will exist then have not even been conceived of yet. And I think that the last few months have sped that up a little bit, don't you think? Well, we can't ignore it anymore. We are in an era of accelerated change. And we have to figure out how to navigate our careers in this age of accelerations. So my name is Anjali Leon, as Finzi mentioned, and I'm founder and principal of PPL Coach. It's a boutique coaching and consulting practice that offers experiential workshops, innovative co-created solutions, and professional coaching in the areas of product, people, and personal leadership. And I specialize in design thinking, lean and agile principles and practices, and the co-active coaching model. But my real joy and fulfillment comes from helping people learn to navigate an increasingly uncertain and changing world. And so today, I want to share with you the story of my own career journey and how I got here, how I got to be founder and principal of PPL Coach. And I'll share some insights about navigating a career amidst accelerating change. And I hope that what I have to share will inspire your own journey to a more fulfilling career. So this year is my daughter, Ariana. You know, Ariana graduated from university last year with a degree in event management. And since then, she started her first real job that she absolutely loved. And if I was to do the stock back in March, uh, when I was so looking forward to actually coming to India and doing the stock there, that would have been where she was at in her journey. But since then, uh, the status of her journey has changed. She has since been furloughed and then laid off. And she finds herself faced with the reality that her school advisors had prepared all of her cohort for, for when she first started college. <laughs> Only thing that we did not expect that it would come so soon. You know, I can vividly remember and recall her college orientation event that my husband and I attended. The university advisors were sharing to all of us parents that uh, we needed to be very particular, that we were clear that our kids would be launching their careers in a world that was very different from the one that we had experienced. And that by the time that they were 10 years into their careers, half of them would be doing jobs that had not even been conceived of yet. And half of the jobs of today won't be around. So her college experience would be less about launching her into a 40 year career and rather a preparation for the critical thinking, the problem solving and lifelong learning skills that she would need to navigate her future. And boy, is she putting that to use now. We as parents, you know, we were relegated to no longer being advisors because we would not really know what the future would look like, but more as coaches, helping them to uncover and tap into their full potential. And I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, what a contrast. 
from when I started my own career 25 years earlier. You know, as a young, ambitious woman growing up in India, I had a natural ability in math and problem solving. And I took the, took the engineering path that just seemed like the natural choice for somebody who was good in the sciences. You know, that's what our upbringing in India taught me. I'm sure many of you can relate. And I thought my path forward was clear and well-defined. Of course, I would do the respectable thing, like find a great company and make my way up that career ladder. A step-by-step -step focused and deliberate climb that was sure to make my family and friends proud. You know what I'm talking about. I knew that at some point that I would come to a fork in the road and I would have to make the choice. And I even knew what that choice was probably going to be. You know, I would have to either choose to continue down a technical leadership path or I would have to make a choice and pick whether I wanted to be in people management. And I knew the answer to that as well. All the way up to CTO, baby. That was my path. I mean, who wants to deal with people, right? You know how the saying goes, man plans and God laughs. Well, in this case, woman plans and God laughs. Because you know what the next 25 years of my career looked like? More like this. A jumble of twists and turns, dead ends and U-turns. More like the random unsteady steps of a drunkard's walk than a well-crafted career roadmap. So I'm curious, what would yours look like? And if we were together in person, I would have you capture your career journey on a piece of paper and share it with the people around you. But in this virtual environment, you'll have to do with uh, reflecting on your journey and going through this experience with me. Uh, as part of your handouts, there's actually a, uh, a series of uh, sheets of paper that include a template to go through this process yourself. So I hope you'll take the time to do that self-reflective journey at some point after this session. But for today, just think about it, just reflect on it. Would it look like this? A clearly defined climb up the ladder in the same company, growing in pay and status over time? Or would it look more like mine? Several different companies, several lateral moves to a different role, and some even step backs in status or salary to make a change possible. You know, when I sat down to draw this map, I thought I was unique. I mean, all the messages around me and what the experience of my parents and their generation had been, it was customary to stay in the same company your entire life. Sometimes even multiple generations stayed in the same company and followed the same trajectory. I would say even 20 years ago, a resume that had too many jumps would be frowned upon. I mean, I did that myself. But in doing this activity with people I coach and in other conversations that I've had, you know what I realized? This is much more common than you would think. There's a fundamental shift happening in our expectations and realities about our careers. I think gone is the metaphor of the latter. So what is the new metaphor? What is the image that comes to mind as you look at your own career journey? I believe that metaphor is a lattice, not a straight path up, but a series of self-selected steps going up, down, sideways, depending on what was happening in your life and the world around you. So what is driving this change? What is going on? I believe all of this change that we're experiencing is as a result of the age of accelerations. The last two decades have brought on unprecedented change, primarily driven by technology. This uh, slide right here represents the curve of the rate of change of technology. 
And you can see it's an exponential curve. We all recognize this type of curve by now. I mean, it's similar to the COVID-19 curve and you know, not good things come from that. So did you know that we exper experience in similar exponential curves for the rate of change in globalization and global markets? A similar exponential curve for environmental factors like climate change and resource depletion. And now things like the pandemic as well. And what's interesting that is all these changes are happening at a faster and faster rate, and they are all happening at once. So you can imagine the level of complexity that we are facing right now. And I'm sure that you'll agree, accelerating change is not fun. Well, if you have ridden in a Tesla and gone from zero to 60 in two seconds, maybe you'll think differently. <laughs> it might be exciting. But you know, whether it's the airplane takeoff or an accelerating car or a roller coaster ride, it brings about a mix of fear and anxiety, even with that excitement. And I don't think that any of us would say we would be comfortable with accelerating change indefinitely. I mean, imagine going, getting, <laughs> never getting to a cruising altitude or speed. You know, we're not used to sustained exponential change. Yet, you know, that's where we find ourselves today in multiple facets of our lives. And our businesses and organizations are experiencing the same. And they're trying to navigate this change. They're trying to respond to these changes uh, so that they can continue to operate and stay profitable. And we are seeing the results of this attempt to navigate change. We're all familiar with it. Many of us work in actually making this happen. You know, if you think about digital transformation journeys, automation, cloud-based technology, data and analytics, are all it's in response to this accelerating change, replacing manual and physical tasks with robots, augmenting human capacity with artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning. And then tapping into a global workforce in order to be able to keep the cost down. Only interestingly, all of these attempts at navigating these accelerating changes are only making those curves even steeper. And it's affecting the workforce, us. You know, for decades, there was an unspoken social contract between employers and employees. The employer said, give us your talent and your energy and we'll take care of you. Well, the demands of the age of acceleration has changed that relationship between that employee and the employer. It is literally reshaping the world of work, impacting not only what we work on, but how we work and who we work with. So about 10 years ago, I started noticing the toll of these changes in the world around me. First, it was in the people I was interviewing for middle level positions. Many were looking for new opportunities after long careers in a very specialized work roles in the organizations. But when they came in for those interviews, you know, I noticed that they looked spent. I mean, their expert skills in a very narrow area did not translate to our context. And they knew it. I could see the anxiety, uncertainty, and lack of confidence in their eyes as they were trying to make this change. And then guess what? I started noticing it in myself. I started noticing its impact on my own emotions and confidence. So for years, you know, I was a software engineer to start out with. And for years, my C++ skills were in high demand. And now I found my once shiny new skills becoming dated. And I tried to keep up with the latest technologies and frameworks. You know, back then I was trying to pick up C Sharp and Windows Presentation Framework and Windows Workflow Foundation and .NET and imaging libraries and design patterns and so on and so forth. And the more I learned, the more there was to learn. And that process was starting to get 
tiresome and painful. And I was finding that I was no longer energized by these topics. And I found myself feeling inadequate next to the much younger software engineers to who this came so easily. And for a person who at once felt at the top of her game, well, this was an unfamiliar feeling. And I recall one day, about a third of the way to my office, I felt an anxiety growing and tears rolling down my cheeks. I realized I could not go to the office that day. I could not bring myself to go to the office that day. So I made a U-turn and came back home and called in a mental health day. And that U-turn was reflective of a much bigger U-turn that was to come. So what I believe I was experiencing is what Thomas Friedman uh, spoke about in his book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations. And it's illustrated in this curve, in this uh, graph. So this curve is showing the rate of change of technology, that's the blue line, and the black line is the rate of human adaptability to change. And we have clearly reached a point where the rate of technology, technological change is outpacing our natural human adaptability. And so there's no wonder we would, it would raise feelings of uncertainty and confusion and anxiety. So what does all this mean for our careers? And what does it mean for you? For me, I realized that something had to change. And the words of Jack Welsh, I remember ringing in my ears. Said, he said, control your own destiny or someone else will. Well, I was not going to allow that to happen. So I paused, I took a deep breath, I reassessed where I was and where I was going. Sure, I would have to grapple with what it would mean for the six-figure salary that I was making and the team of coworkers that I loved. But what I uncovered changed the trajectory of my life and is what I want to share with you today in case you are looking to change the trajectory of your life. So I had come across this concept of Ikigai. Uh, and if any of you have come across this concept of Ikigai, give me a thumbs up. As a matter of fact, I would love to get some response from uh, those who are, of you who are listening, so that I know that you are listening. Give me a thumbs up uh, if, you, if something resonates with you and it'll at least give me some feedback uh, on what's going on. So, Based on this Ikigai concept that I'm going to cover in a moment, uh, I started asking, scored my, I scored myself in these four areas. I scored myself in the scale of one to 10, my level of satisfaction in this area, and the trend that I was experiencing in that level of satisfaction. So the first one that I checked in on was, was my work reflecting my strengths and what I was naturally good at? And when I first started my career, I would have rated this much higher. But at this point, when I was assessing myself, I gave it a seven. And I noticed that uh, the way things were changing, this was trending down. I also asked myself, does my work allow me to earn a decent living? And that got a nine. I was making a very good salary and was appreciated at my work. And I expected that trend to just go up. Uh, that I would continue to be rewarded for the work that I was doing and contributing. And then I asked myself, is my work aligned to my strongest motivators? Does it bring me energy? Well, this is what was taking the biggest toll on me. At this point, I rated this only a five. And this was on its way down if I did do something about it. And lastly, I asked myself, is my work creating a positive impact in the world. And true, in the small circle that I was in, in my organization and people around me and our customers, it was true. But in, ter in terms of a larger context, uh, in the bigger world, 
I didn't see my work making that much of an impact a positive impact in the world. And I didn't see, uh, if I stayed in the status quo, it would remain somewhat uh, the same, I thought. So it was clear for me that something had to change. So let me give you a little bit of a background on this concept of ikigai. So ikigai is a Japanese term that means reason for being, the reason why you get up in the morning. And its origins lie in Okinawa, Japan. And this of Ikigai is touted as the secret to a long and happy life that the people in Okinawa enjoy. Now, finding your Ikigai, as you can see, is a pretty introspective journey, and it's a very personal journey. And it has to be a voluntary journey that you undertake to really uncover the answers to these questions. And once you do, it is, it, you can see that it probably is an authentic expression of yourself. The essence of the Ikigai is captured in this framework that you see on the screen. It answers four questions. What am I good at? What do I love to do? What can I get paid for? And what does the world need of me? And you'll see, interestingly, these kind of line up to our human needs of survival, stability, success, and significance. And in the Western world, we might uh, use the term purpose instead of ikigai or bliss. Now, the problem with how we have traditionally looked at careers is that they just looked to answer two of these questions. What am I good at and what can I get paid for? And many times it is, what, can, what am I good at that I can get paid the most for? Well, in a world that's constantly changing, what I can get paid to do is constantly changing, which means I need to continually find what I'm good at to align to that. And if you don't like what it is that it's leading you to, it can lead to a lot of anxiety and misery, as you can imagine. So I decided to start with a different set of questions and this is what i would recommend others start where i would recommend others start as well and the first question is what do i love what motivates me what fuels my energy and i went through a uh, real self-awareness and introspective journey to find this out i uh, enrolled in a leadership program where they did a bunch of assessments to help us understand this. And you might be familiar with some of these ways to understand, you know, what motivates you and what fuels your energy. You might uh, have done something like the DISC or Insights Profile or the Management 3.0's Moving Motivators to uncover this. And I also dug into what I'm naturally good at. What are my strengths? Uh, what are my skills? And here, I did the Strengths Finders, which is a great uh, assessment tool to uncover your strengths, your top strengths, and some 360-degree feedback um, from my colleagues, um, from people I reported to, to understand what my true skills were. Interestingly, I really didn't need that because there were clues throughout my journey that were there all along. And when I look back at this map that I had created and started asking myself some questions, I noticed what these clues were. So I noticed which of these roles that I played throughout my career generated the peak experiences of my career, where I had a lot of energy for my work and my contributions were making a real impact. And then, I uncovered what was I doing that gave me that energy and what skills was I using while I was having those peak experiences. And here's some of the things that I uncovered. What do I love to do? I realized I love inspiring and motivating people. I love creating shared understanding, solving problems, creating connections. And some of the things that I was naturally good at was seeing trends and patterns that had led me down the engineering path before and the math well, was a skill that I possessed and that led me down the engineering path before as well. But I also was good at creative problem solving, learning new things quickly, listening, this is one of my power skills and teaching and mentoring. 
And what I noticed the patterns that were emerging was well, they were more around people and less with technology. So in your packets, in your handouts, there is this uh, particular template. And I encourage you to map it out. Find the patterns uh, in your in answering these questions for yourself and then share it with a colleague or a mentor or a coach. Get some feedback and insights from them. And answering these two questions of what do you love and what are you naturally good at, you uncover what your passion is. And as Confucius says, do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life. Meaning that if you do what you love, it won't feel like work. You will be working a lot, but it won't feel like work. But if you stop here, if it's, these are the only two questions that you ask, it might lead you to be a starving artist. So I recommend that you ask a third question. What can I get paid for? What can I do that others value? Now in the age of accelerations, this is the moving target. But we have some clues. So let's dig into some of those clues in terms of trends that we are seeing so far, and this might change. But here's some of the things that I have noticed that I'd love to share with you. So we're already seeing the repeatable mass market solutions and manual jobs being replaced by automation and robots. And we are starting to also see that jobs based on expertise or precedent or data, anything that can be analyzed or codified, like healthcare diagnoses, like criminal sentencing, like analytics and forecasting, are being replaced by artificial intelligence. You know, when it comes to processing a lot of data, machines are just better at it. I mean, for all of us, our expert is Google now, right? So these will likely account for the 50% of the jobs that will disappear. So what clues are there about the 50% that have not been conceived of yet? What might they look like? Because that's where we want to pay, atten uh, pay attention. So here are some trends that are emerging. Technology and connectivity is resulting in us as consumers being much more informed and savvy. And we are not looking for mass market solutions. We want niche products personalized to our needs, our context, our concerns. We want solutions that solve our problem, our unique problem. And we are willing to change vendors we don't really care about brand loyalty anymore. We want that thing that makes us do our job better. Consumer trends are also showing a shift in spending from physical products more towards experiences and services that make our life easier. So there's a real need to understand the customer and personalize those experiences for the customer. And in responding to these customer needs, will require capabilities that I believe are uniquely human. Creativity, imagination, curiosity, social and emotional intelligence, empathy. And we are likely going to see a result of these shifts in the workplace as well. And we're already, I believe, seeing some of this. So for decades, we were obsessed with efficiency and output. And that's shifting. For a lot of us, our language is shifting to how can we get more effective solutions? How can we get better outcomes? And the outcomes that we're talking about are what I just alluded to, a better experience for our customers. So in the workplace, and what we as humans will do in response to that will be things like routine tasks. Now, our work would shift to more creative work and less on routine tasks. Uh, value is going to be placed more on versatilists over specialists, people that are adaptable, people that cross domains, people that can solve more complex problems. Hierarchies and centralized decision making is giving way to more networked organizations, leveraging the talent of many. And humans will be seen less as a commodity resource and more as a source of creativity and innovation. 
So going forward, there'll probably be less of titles, a place that you fill, and more of a role, a role that you play in an organization. So what would those roles look like? Uh, for this, I want to share with you an article from the Harvard Business Review. And it talked about the three future job roles for knowledge workers. And I bring this to you because I'm already noticing these trends in our work environments already, particularly in a, as we bring Agile into the work world. So the, the first role being a composer. So composers are people who deeply understand the aspirations and needs of the consumer and they can compose engaging and rewarding experiences for them. These are people who love designing and discovering new things. And people who love that feel right at home, will feel right at home in this role. The second role is that of creators. These are the people who can anticipate the rapidly changing needs of the customers and design and deliver creative and tailored products. They can bring the experience that was composed, they can bring it to life. And people who fit well into this role are the people who love to take an idea and make it real, implementers. And last but not least are the coaches. And coaches are the people who help others and their customers achieve their potential. And we are likely to see coaches in all forms in all different areas, from wellness coaches and sports coaches to fitness coaches, career coaches, gardening coaches, travel coaches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we are already seeing this trend. And people who love helping people develop and show up as their best selves, well, they fit beautifully in this particular role. So maybe you're seeing a parallel as well to what I saw in terms of roles in the agile roles in our organizations. And you can see how the product owner role fits so nicely in the role of composer, team members in the role of creator and scrum master in the role of coach. So which of these most resonate for you? How do you know what paid role will fulfill what you love and what you are good at? Well, you got to experiment and try to, to discover that. And don't be surprised if you find the answer in the most unlikely of places. You know, for me and how I came into my uh, agile coaching role uh, was finding a book in the bookstore and that too in a family church camp bookstore, the only agile book in that little bookstore. And I was the first question I actually asked was, what is an agile book doing here? I was a scrum master at the time, doing the scrum master role along with uh, my, my development role. And I was leading the scrum adoption in my organization. So I picked it up thinking that I would learn a thing or two. And it did not take me past the introduction of that book uh, to realize that what I could get paid for by doing the thing that I loved and was naturally good at. Things that I was already doing willingly and never even considered it as work. I could not believe that there was actually a name for this role. And so that's how I find, found what it is that met uh, those questions for me. What was I good at? What do I love? What can I get paid for? And the coach role might not be the one for you. You might align very nicely with the composer or the creator. So when you find the intersection of what you love, what you're good at, and what you've been paid to do, then you found the intersection of your passion, and your profession. And this is an amazing place to be. Inevitably, you are on your path to success. So you might ask, okay, how do I get there from where I'm at? Well, we are agilists and we know how to do this. We start by doing something, right? Learn, gain new knowledge. You might uncover something, practice, build experience, experiment, try something new. Do some action and then pause and assess. Did I love it? Am I good at it? Is it something that I can get paid to do? And based on the answer, adapt. You might decide that you want to gain some additional knowledge and get better at it. You might want to practice more to get better at it. 
or you might try something different because this is not quite what resonates with you and the cycle will continue. So what if you are here? You know what you love and what you're good at. So now you're looking for opportunities to get paid to do it. The best way to do this is to demonstrate your skill and passion for it. So let others know what you love and how you're good at it. So you might sign up to do that kind of work at your organization, or you might try a side gig, uh, or you might start applying for a job that allows you to do what to, allows you to get paid for what you love and what you're good at. Now, what if you are here? If you're good at it and you are getting paid to do it, but you don't love it. And some of us find ourselves in this place. And what you have to do here is just try new things. So consider uh, filling in for somebody in your organization that's performing a different role. And maybe when they're on vacation, or maybe uh, if they've taken a day off, maybe you want to pair with them and see what their work world looks like. Perhaps you might suggest a role swap for a week or so in your organization or within your team. Uh, try something new in your volunteer organization. This is a really safe space to try different things to uncover what are the stuff, what are the things that you love. There's great clues of what you love in just the hobbies that you do. And so you might find ways to bring in aspects of your hobby into your work. And notice your energy as you're doing this. Uh, that will be giving you clues on what it is that you love. And what if you're here? Well, you love it. You're getting paid to do it, but you're not good at it yet. Well, this is the best place to be because we know how to, to work through this. From here, you can learn and practice and pursue mastery in it. So if, this, if you leave this room remembering only one thing, I hope it is this. And it's a quote from Steve Jobs, who was a great example of doing work that aligns with what you love, what you're good at, and what you can get paid for. He said, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And I'd like to extend that because through my own experience, I believe that the only fulfilling way to navigate a career in this age of accelerations is to find and do what you love. Because once you find it, You'll find yourself on a path that is a curious, continuous learning journey that's a welcoming journey. And as philosopher Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss and doors will open where you did not know they were going to be. But don't expect to stop there. Just when you are skillfully navigating your career, there will likely come a point when you will start asking a more profound question. What does the world need of me? What do I stand for? What impact can I create in the world? And based on what's happening in the world right now, that question may come sooner rather than later. So I will also leave you with this inquiry. What does the world need of you? What do you stand for? What impact do you want to create in the world? And you can start with what makes you come alive. Because as the author, philosopher, and civil rights activist Howard Thurman said, what the world needs right now is people who have come alive. I hope you enjoyed that presentation and I hope that you have lots of takeaways uh, to bring into your own uh, journey to navigating your career. And I would open it up for questions. So can see if there anything 
there's one question that's come up um uh, does all these four questions come as stages of your experience in your career trajectory yeah anirudha so absolutely and and i actually now ask these questions of myself on a regular basis i reassess because things are changing so fast and uh, for me when i first started my own career journey i like everybody else asked just the two questions what am i good at what can i get paid for in fact what can i get paid the most for with what i am good at and that was what took me down the the path of engineering and i enjoyed it i enjoyed it i loved it for many years but it was not sustaining and when i switched uh, to first ask what is it that i love and what am i good at those are the first two questions and use that to decide uh what can i get paid for and as things are changing in terms of what you can get paid for the the first two uh are kind of your uh, north star to uncover the things that you um that that way you can apply you what you love and what you're good at let's give uh, anjali a thumbs up for uh, all the hard work she's done and for the wonderful session anjali you can see all the thumbs up coming up for you that's beautiful uh, thank you